Our, our last but not least uh, speaker is Ben Mansky. Uh, ben is an American sociologist, lawyer, and de democracy advocate. He is the founder of the Liberty Tree Foundation for the Democratic Revolution and co-founder of Move to Amend, Wisconsin Wave, and the 180 degree Movement for Democracy and Education and United for Peace and Justice. In 2011, he served as chair as the first biennial democracy convention, and I am so pleased to see him again after all these years. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I have to say, World Beyond War and your partners have put together an excellent peace and democracy conference here at the Democracy Convention, uh, and I'm honored to have been asked to join this panel. Um, uh, the work that, uh, that you have uh, presented and that you have um, sort of uh, clarified for a popular audience and uh, that I look forward to reading more about and the work that you have done, David, uh, to bring this history forward to those audiences and to put the call out and to help people get together and do the organizing around us, I think, are really critical. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, two additional cases that are cases from history, uh, one of them recent history, the other uh, too distant, um, that uh, represent other approaches to dealing with uh, essentially the same fundamental problem, which is uh, how do we prevent war from uh, taking place. Um, and uh, you know, some of what I'm going to say will be very familiar to you, some of it will maybe be familiar to some of you, and some of it I expect will be quite new to most of you. Uh, I'll start with a familiar, uh, and that is uh, to quote from uh, James, uh, from John Quincy Adams, uh, who I mistakenly actually thought this was a quote from Washington. I think Adams was paraphrasing Washington when he said, "America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy." And I think Washington uh, had a similar statement about beasts to slay. Um, you know, the, there are many things that were uh, terrible about the years that followed the great years of the American Revolution. Um, the years between 1776 and um, uh, 1791. Uh, those, were the, those were the good years, but there were many things uh, that were terrible about the years that followed, but there were also some things that um, in our critique of um, American history and the way it's been presented, many I think on the left have forgotten. And one of those is that um, there is an originalism that is true, uh, and that has been forgotten not only by the majority of the American people, but certainly by the federal courts. And that is an originalism that understands that uh, the founding fathers uh, were um, concerned about the prospects of the United States becoming a particular kind of empire. There was a type of empire they wanted the United States to be, an empire from coast to coast, an empire that would uh, sweep savagery, uh, a, a white supremacist empire, right? Uh, here in the continent of North America, but they were also concerned that the United States not become the kind of empire that they had just rebelled against, uh, in an empire that spanned the globe. Uh, and the concern, that concern is actually uh, very clearly laid out in the Constitution of the United States in providing that uh, only Congress has the power to declare war, right? Um, and that, I think, is what I, is commonly known. And it's commonly known in part because most of the people in this room um, either came of age politically in the years following Vietnam or were around for the days of the, of the War Powers Resolution 1973 and the reaction to the Vietnam War, in which it was recognized that the United States had entered a new period in our history in that we had been through the Korean War and the Vietnam War and a whole series of smaller wars that were called other things, right? Um, and that Congress had not voted to declare war in any of those instances. And so there was a reaction to that. Uh, and um, there was a, uh, a movement to try to uh, prevent Congress from um, sort of abdicating its war declaring uh, responsibilities that produced the War Powers Resolution. It's really a War Powers Act, right? It's, it's actually. Uh, has the force of law that states that um, the president uh, has to go to Congress for authorization should military hostilities be commenced. I believe it's within 60 days, is that correct? I'm looking for, I believe it's a 60 day period, yeah. Um, so that was sort of an attempt to fix a fundamental problem, which is that, that was recognized in the years following Viet at the end of the Vietnam War, at least in terms of our involvement in the Vietnam War, uh, which was that 
Um, we had a constitution which was intended to ensure that the war declaring powers, the war initiating powers, resided with Congress, with a legislative branch that was uh, sort of more accountable to the people, supposedly, and to the legislatures originally, uh, and not with the executive, because there was a fear of kingly powers being held by the president, that the president would become a king, and that the United States would become an imperial power that, uh, of the type that we had rebelled against, Great Britain, right? Um, so there was, there was some pushback there. Um, that has had very limited effect, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and uh, the effects of the War Powers Act were um, sort of present, especially in the decade following. But if you look at um, our recent experience, we uh, uh, have seen that uh, Republican or Democrat uh, in the White House, um, there are certain processes that are larger than single men or individuals, depending on who occupies. Uh, the Oval Office. And so under Obama, we actually had, uh, to my knowledge, for the first time, a president who chose not to abide by the provisions of, of the War Powers Act in Libya, uh, did not seek congressional authorization. Uh, other uh, major military actions uh, conducted by the United States that have been prolonged, that have gone on for longer periods of time, uh, have been authorized by acts of Congress. They're called authorizations for the use of military force, or a AUMF. Um, but that action was not, and to my knowledge, neither has the Syria uh, campaign uh, and other campaigns uh, since. So um, that's, sort of the, that's where we stand right now. That we have this fundamental problem that has been recognized uh, by large sections of the population that uh, Congress is supposed to have the power to declare war, but Congress doesn't actually exercise that power. Now that recognition could be addressed in a couple different ways. Right? It could be addressed statutorily, as was done in the 1970s in this country. It can be addressed in the streets, it can be addressed through an appeal to international law and bringing international law to localities and to the states and to uh, non-party uh, states and to broader populations, and it should be. Um, it could also be addressed by recognizing that perhaps Congress cannot be trusted to uh, exercise that word declaring power. And that recognition led to a 20-year campaign, the beginning of the 20th century, and the years especially following World War I and leading into uh, unfortunately, World War II, uh, to take the power to declare war from Congress and give it to the people. And that amendment, the War Referendum Amendment, which became known as the Ludlow Amendment, L-U-D-L-O-W, um, sponsored at various points by other members of Congress, but uh, he represented the state of Indiana. Um, uh, below of Wausau, Wisconsin, was the lead sponsor in the House. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, uh, this was a multi-partisan initiative that came out of the peace movement of the day to make clear that um, unless the United States was militarily invaded, the power to declare war resided with the people of the United States, and it, set out, it sets out terms for a national vote on declaring war. Right? Um, and uh, the Ludlow Amendment actually came very close to winning majority support in the House of Representatives. It looked like it was going to pass uh, in 1937. Um, and uh, it was only for a last minute series of interventions from members of the Roosevelt administration to uh, arm twist uh, House Democrats that led to uh, Ludlow uh, not actually uh, making it to a uh, full vote, in which, it would have, um, which it would have won. Um, so that was a push, the Ludlow Amendment. Uh, in the 1970s, there were some who uh, remembered that history or relearned it. Uh, Congressman Ron Dellums, who some of you uh, will know of, uh, was the lead sponsor of the People Power Over War Amendment, which is modeled after the Ludlow Amendment. And this is one approach that um, it, it had sort of, there was less of a mass movement behind this that was organized. I mean, the campaigning for Ludlow was just incredible in the 1930s. But it did have uh, multiple co-sponsors in Congress uh, and was attempted again. Right? Um, I've written about this history. I didn't actually have time to go back and reread my article about it, but it appeared in a book, uh, Come Back, Come Home America, uh, dot US. Uh, which, do you have a chapter in there? Probably. I, don't know. I think so. Yeah, you can find it. Uh, if you go to my website, which I'll put up here, benmansky.com, you can find a link to my publications which are on academia, and I've decided to include some of my uh, 
uh, a lot of the work that I've done that's not actually academic work. I, mm -hmm. I am in a PhD program, I have a law degree, uh, but some of this research that I did uh, on the Ludlow Amendment was you know, sort of for fun, right? <laughs> like, what can we do to help the peace movement in this day and age develop to bring back a new tool? Um, and so I did that research, um, and the title of that chapter and then an article that was based on it is um, The Struggle to Put Ballots Before, before Bullets. Um, so you can find that up there. Um, how much time do I have here? Uh, you have five minutes. Okay. So mm -hmm. the, the more important part I have less time mm -hmm. for, so I'll try to uh, bring this forward. So I would advocate that, that we take up the war referendum amendment again uh, for all kinds of reasons we can get into the discussion, but it's probably obvious to you. The other effort that was made from the very beginning and to prevent uh, the United States from becoming uh, sort of a global imperial power and from uh, becoming, frankly, a, a problem for the people of this country and of, of, uh, of other nations, um, was to uh, constitutionalize war powers in practice and not just in text, right? To recognize that constitutions matter um, when they are um, uh, they are actually felt in the distribution of, of material power in society. So I'm using sociological terms, Marxist terms even in that case, but basically what I'm talking about is the constitution of the armed forces of the United States from the get-go was designed to prevent uh, the executive branch from engaging in um, uh, sort of rampant imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States, um, and I don't have time to get into the whole history of law, and Leah Bolger knows as well, so I'm not going to even get into the, the history of uh, to the text of the Constitution and so on, but uh, I'll summarize it this way, and I feel fully confident to, to defend what I'm about to say in simple terms if we need to get into details. Um, we did not have uh, a armed forces that were capable of force projection in the United States until World War I. Okay. Uh, in 1898, in the uh, days leading up to the uh, U.S. invasion of various Spanish colonial possessions, uh, Cuba, Guam, et cetera, et cetera, um, the Army of the United States had 10,000 men under arms, and there were over 200,000 uh, members of the regular trained militia in the United States, or National Guard, as they were then known. Okay? So for most of the history of this country, um, we did not have, not only, we didn't not only have an Air Force or a Pentagon, but we didn't even have an army that was capable of invading and occupying another country. And so, uh, and, and this was by design, right? It's, there are several clauses in the Constitution that are called the Militia Clauses. It's not just uh, the Second Amendment, right? There are several other clauses in the Constitution that deal with the militia, right? And the, uh, the armed forces of the United States were pr primarily composed of a well-regulated militia, uh, operating through the states and regulated by Congress that were intended to provide for uh, national defense, but were understood to uh, uh, prove a bane of empire, as um, uh, uh, Elbridge uh, uh, Gary of Massachusetts, he was much maligned because he's the source of the term uh, gerrymander, right? Mm -hmm. But he was also an anti-imperialist, and he called the militia the bane of empire. Basically, by having a popular army a uh, popular military, I should say, that uh, was made up of the people themselves who would not be willingly sent over to the Philippines, for example, as militia units were, and to uh, kill and hunt other people who were like us, right? And I'm sort of paraphrasing from some of the accounts of militia members who were inducted into the uh, army for that invasion and occupation. Um, we would uh, not, we would be in a position to prevent uh, the executive branch from engaging in uh, empire building. Uh, of the kind that we have in the 20th century, right? So um, there's a whole history of uh, the uh, of the militia system, which is very important and interesting. I can give you a number, of, many examples of the ways in which the militia system functioned to provide a restraint on uh, empire building in the War of 1812. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, for example, his first elected commission was as captain of a unit of the Illinois militia. Uh, his unit actually refused to go back to fight in what is now Wisconsin in the Black Hawk Wars for, again, some of these same reasons. You know, Lincoln said, we could see that these were men like ourselves who were farmers, right? Um, there were many sort of examples in which the militia actually refused to participate in actions that um, were counter to their interests, right? Um, 
but essentially what you need to know is that the 20th century, 20th century is in part a history of the federalization of the militia system. The transformation of a system which primarily had been decentralized and intended to be the vein of empire into an auxiliary of the United States Armed Forces to the point at which uh, today um, the bulk of U.S. occupying forces actually come out of the National Guard or out of private military con contractors and are not regular U.S. Army. Right? This is a fairly recent development. Okay? So uh, that's a bit of the, that's a very uh, quickly summed up <laughs> history there of, of the National Guard, of the purpose behind the militia system and the National Guard and, and so on. Um, what you should know is that uh, for three years, there was a very active campaign in 20 states in the United States to, quote, bring, guard, bring the guard home, it's the law. Uh, and that's where uh, some of us in this room came together. We got legislation introduced in 13 of those states to require that governors review federalization orders calling the guard into national service prior to releasing them into service to ensure that that order was lawful. The legal strategy here was pretty sophisticated. It's not my own, it's that of, of Benson Scotch of Vermont. But uh, we got pretty far. We got majority support in two chambers, uh, and then Barack Obama was elected, and we lost uh, most of our Democratic sponsors, unfortunately, uh, is what happened with that campaign. Mm -hmm. This may be a time to bring back the Bring the Guard Home, it's the law campaign, uh, and I look forward to uh, talking with you about uh, other strategies we can pursue here. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Bolger was a major, a really a major force in that effort.